Okay, great. So let's get started. Um, as before, I am recording this meeting. I have double checked, it looks like I am. Um, Nate, do you see that recording thing? Last time you were the one who pointed out that we didn't actually have the recording on. I see it. Okay, awesome. It. Um, great. What I'd love to do is actually for this Hangout to s encourage participation from uh, people who are able to attend. So what we could do is, and this is going to be a test on what Zoom does here too. I was wondering if everyone could just go around and say their name and what company they are at. Company, organization, institute, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, let's see. Ned, do you want to start? Hi, I am Ned, and I work here at NEDX on the Open NEDX team, and I have done for quite some time. And um, I'll go. I'll go next because I guess it's Open NEDX. Uh, so I'm Nimisha. I'm a, a, you're an engineer at NEDX. Um, also managing our architecture going forward. So taking the role of chief architect as well. And now, what? Do, who's next on the list? Do you guys see in the participants? Or we can go by. I wonder what's consistent across all members. Or we can try to see if who who do we see next, like on the horizontal thing on top. Or who's brave enough to just start talking? Yeah, we could. Do, yeah, go ahead. Someone unmuted. Okay, uh, John Baldwin, uh, software engineer with Assembler. Oh, uh, I guess one of the more visible things that I work on is figures, uh, the lightweight analytics uh, package that you plug right into the elements. I also organize Django Boston. Yes, I'm Robert from University of Montreal, and I'm the coordinator of the Edulib platform. Hi, this is Pierre Mayotte from uh, Montreal, from Edulib 2. I'm the sysadmin for Edulib. Great. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Peter Pinch from MIT, just down the street from edX. Uh, we run Open edX for MIT students uh, and uh, do lots of other integrations with Open uh, edX. And I'm Tobias, and I work with Peter down the street from edX, and I do most of the work on running the actual platform and keeping it healthy the sentence after I do most of the work. I was saying that I do it, most of the work of running the platform and keeping it healthy for students. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Close enough. <laughs> we have a few more people. Okay, I uh, guess I'll go. Or Anders, go ahead. Uh, I'm Anders Pearson. I work at AppAssembler with Nate and John and whoever else we have here. And I'm Nate Ani. Uh, been involved in the community for a while and I'm uh, running AppAssembler together with uh, Anders and John and others. TJ is here too. Yeah, TJ and Sar. Yeah, sorry guys, I just joined up. Um, I'm TJ, I'm a, an engineer at AppAssembly. Ah, oh, great. And uh, we have, did SAR go? Introduce themselves? Uh, it's Sar, he's, uh, he's my coworker here and his audio is not working. Ah, oh, no problem. Okay, right, sounds great. So another MIT person. And um, JM just walked into the room. John, Mark, you want to just introduce yourself? Hi, I'm John Mark. I'm the uh, OpenX community lead. So if you have complaints about how we run our community, just uh, tell me. <laughs> I'm on, uh, you'll see me on Slack on the mailing list. So. Great. Okay, right, so we're going to get started. Um, so I had to go through introductions there, but I would love for, I uh, just want to make sure everyone's 
microphones are working and all that stuff. And um, sorry, you can always go over the shoulders with Tobias. Um, and uh, so we can have more of a two-way conversation going forward on this Hangout. Um, I will go ahead and share, unless, now, did you have anything you want to share screen-wise? Okay, so the, our first agenda item was from Ned. So Ned, why don't you get started while I figure out my sharing? Okay, um, so the first thing is that it is now 2019, and that means that next year is 2020, and that means that January 1st, 2020, is when Python will stop supporting Python 2, and shortly after that is when Django will stop supporting Django 1. And because of those two things, we need to somehow get all of our code running on Python 3. Um, it's a big job. Jeremy Bowman, who can't be right here right now, but will be here at the end of the hour in case there are more questions about this. Uh, Jeremy Bowman is heading up the organization of this effort, trying to track down all the work that needs to happen, um, come up with some strategies for testing and tooling to help us with it. Uh, but we're looking for ideas from the community also about making sure, one, that we've found all the things that need to happen, two, that we have done everything we can to engage the community as broadly as possible to get the work done, uh, and then to actually do work to uh, solve the problem that we are all facing, that the code that we all rely on is going to be running only on unsupported infrastructure if we don't get this work done. So one of the ways that Jeremy has uh, organized is to create a new project, and that's not that new at this point, a, a project in JIRA dedicated to uh, small chunks of work that will incrementally help us get to the Python 3 milestone. So that is the INCR project, I-N-C-R, in uh, JIRA. Um, those tickets are meant to be small and uncontroversial. Uh, for instance, upgrade this dependency from the one that does, doesn't support Python 3 to the one that does. Um, I hope that everyone here has had a chance to take a look at those tickets and thought about how they could contribute to closing some of those tickets. Uh, we're looking for other ideas about how to engage the broader community as well. Um, I don't have much more to say about that, but I'm interested in ideas right now if people have them. Uh, which Inker tickets have you taken on? Why have you not taken on any Inker tickets? What should you be doing in addition to Inker tickets? Uh, how do you feel about the impending Python 3 upgrade? Et cetera. Anyone? Bueller? Yeah, so we'll open it up to the Hangout here if um, anybody has anything to add or questions or suggestions. So, John Baldwin here. I have not looked at the Inker tickets. I've been meaning to, but just I haven't. Um, so this is part of encouragement to, to, to look at them. Um, the other thing is, is that I had stood up Hawthorne um, back at the previous conference with Jeremy's uh, workshop. Huh? And honestly, I haven't touched Hawthorne since. I've been busy mostly with Ginkgo. Um, you know, supporting um, a customer infrastructure. Yep. So, but I, I really want to get involved and contribute. And so one of the scenarios I'm looking at here is that I know I can go root around, get information, get Hawthorne working again. And for myself, that's fine. I can get myself figured out. But I'm stepping back and looking to the story of, let's say I'm a mid-level or maybe junior Django developer. And you know what? Hey, I want to like really like, you know, d d dive in the well and uh, get and, and work on open edX because it's a big Django project. How do I even get started? Um, so, you know, and, and I'm kind of rolling back to thinking about when I got involved in Rails, I started learning it years and years ago. There were like all kinds of videos on here's how to do that. Here's how to do this. I know that's an, amount, an immense amount of effort to like you know, build like a body of that together. But if there was like one video that was like, you know, here, um, here's how to get from zero to Hawthorne dev stack in 15 minutes or whatever, um, that'll get developers going 
almost kind of like a, a, a kit. I want to say, well, like it has the video and like, here's that, that those are just some random thoughts. Yep. Um, great. So those are bring up some really good ideas. So Jeremy has been looking into how to smooth off the onboarding for developers who want to get into Inker tickets, um, which is especially important for Inker compared to other contributions, because the whole point of an Inker ticket is it should actually be a small thing to accomplish, which changes the ratio of how much work do I have to do to get started versus how much work do I have to do to make the contribution. It changes it to even more dramatically counterweighted towards the unfortunate on-ramping instead of the actual doing the work. Um, so he's definitely been doing some work like that and been using some of the initial Inker volunteers as guinea pigs on to figure out where that process needs to be improved. Um, you mentioned Hawthorne a couple of times. Hawthorne, of course, is old at this point, back from July. So to do this work, you'd really be getting onto master. Um, and by the way, Ironwood is impending as well. The iron ironwood stands for impending. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, this also, but you also brought up a really good point. So you as a service provider are supporting Ginkgo for your customers. What is gonna happen on the 1st of January, 2020 with the Python 2 going out of support if you're still actually on an 18 month old release of Open Ed X? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep isn't an answer. Um, I'm not sure if yep you is confer that. Yep is confirming that, you know, we all need to do the upgrade. I'm, okay. I can't, you know, it, I'm with you that, yeah, this is the impending issue that we're all facing. Right. Okay. He's acknowledging the issue and um, Great. they'll need to figure out a solution as well. Okay. I wanted to add there, we were some of the first guinea pigs for the ink projects. Um, when, just when we came back from the last conference, I said, I'm, I'm getting some new people in my team and I'm going to use the ink projects to make them run the, the pipeline of making open source PRs. And I think that really worked. Yeah, uh, it made it a lot easier because it was super clear what the goal of the issue was. Yeah, maybe fix one file and make it uh, Python three compatible or whatnot. And then it was mostly a thing of fighting, not fighting, but navigating the waters of making that PR landing master, which was uh, simpler than normal, the normal. Um, in any case, it's not an easy process. So we did it for a while. I think I asked my new team members to close two or three PRs in incremental projects. And by the time they were done, they didn't actually feel like doing more of them. <laughs> so that was right. tough. But I think, at least for me, it was a win-win. The project won something and I got my team more involved. That, that sounds great. Thanks for sharing that, Felipe. Um, Ned, do you think uh, we can get a quote from Felipe and we can post it somewhere on our website or somewhere or another? What was the quote after doing a few that didn't, didn't feel like doing any more? Whoa, no. we have it recorded, so we can get that quote. Okay. But we can also we can also ask him. To no, or, please don't quote me on that. Better quote <laughs> me on it was great for my team. <laughs> okay, good. I like that one better. Yeah, that's a good quote. Wait, why aren't I in marketing? What was the reason again? Okay. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> but feel free to send uh, Felipe an, oh, um, a Slack message or something with an official quote that you like. Uh, publicize. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, I would love to. Uh, and by the way, sorry, I'm the voice of God at this point. Um, just to that point, I would love to get a bunch of you guys. We're launching a podcast this month. I'd love to set up interviews with a bunch of you guys, what you're doing. This, and this seems like the kind of topic that we'd like to address. It'll be a mix of technical and pedagogical, but this would definitely be part of that. So I'm um, happy to touch base with you guys. Uh, and Felipe, that's definitely something I like this would do. Great. Um, okay, so anything more on the Inker? We'll move forward. And anyone else have ideas about their efforts on Inker or how to in increase the efforts on Inker? Or do you have your own strategies for Python 3? Uh, this is a bit of a digression, but do you guys have a way that you sort of 
keep track of the status of the project in JIRA? Because there's actually been more motion on this than I realized. Not, not to say that there isn't a lot to do, but. Um. Um, I think, you know what, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'll put that down as something we definitely need to have a handle on, which is uh, sort of a trend line on progress, which would be good for our own purposes, too. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say along those lines, maybe if there's an easy way to post something in Slack that reminds us how many days left and how many <laughs> issues left there are. A doomsday clock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I was going to add to your question of what are our strategies for Python 3. We've been doing a very heavy push to move all our custom code into plugins that we test for both Python 2 and 3. So okay. the new stuff we're doing, we try to make everything be on plugins that we can test for both. And okay. we're sort of, we're trying to remove all the, all the changes that are, I don't know if all, it's, it's a attainable goal, but we're trying to move as many as we can, the, the changes that we do to the platform to plugins, so that we can start moving closer to master. Because even though we are now in Halcon, as you mentioned, this is old code already, so contributing new things to master and then have to wait until the release is cut and then we migrate in order to get those changes is, it's a loop that is too long and we probably get discouraged to do it more. Mm. You know, this, this brings to mind a conversation we were having with Jeremy earlier today, which was how do we, like what, what should the communication process be for this? How do we get people involved, but keep them involved? How do we keep updates? Like somebody said, like if we could see like a visualization of our progress, you know, tracking our progress as we go along. So we know like, you know, like you said, what's D-Day. Um, these are all things that we're, we're trying to figure out. So to the extent that you have um, ideas for how we can track this and how to keep people involved and in coming back we'd love to hear it um, because I think uh, that's going to be essential to the success uh, of this uh, of this project so right. um, what, I, I would love to hear more about this topic Jeremy is going to join us in the second half so maybe um, we can what well, you can mull it over uh, during the, the, the pauses between sentences and the rest of this presentation. Uh, and we'll pick up the conversation when Jeremy comes back because he'll have some more answers about Inker. And by the way, the Python 3 work doesn't all fit into Inker tickets. There'll be some other larger, much larger pieces too. So it's, it's a, big, a big thing to get our heads around. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so sorry for being late. Uh, maybe I missed uh, something. Um, for the um, upgrade to Python 3, uh, is, is it worth organizing an event like um, a week-long uh, remote hackathon? Um, did you already mention that maybe? We haven't mentioned that. That's one of the things we've been thinking about is whether a hackathon uh, would, would be a good way to do it. Um, I like hackathons as a way of getting people's attention on things. It's not a good way to get sustained attention on things, um, but we could uh, look at what work there is to do and organize it as some quick hits to make some good progress. So that's definitely one of the things we've been thinking about. Uh, and, Thanks, and if anyone in the community wants to help us plan that out or have, has, have ideas of how to do a worldwide remote hackathon on Open edX, we'd love to you know, reach yeah. out to us, yeah. And it sounds like it could be fun. We could make it fun. We could have online events. And yeah, there, that sounds like a great idea. Get fabulous awesome. prizes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I'll, I'll stop and wait for Jeremy to <laughs> I, I have an idea. OK. OK, yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, OK, actually, what I want to do is quickly, uh, because we, we did um, spend a lot of time on Inker, which was a good uh, time spent here, and we may want to do a little bit more. Uh, which of these topics do you think are worthwhile pursuing right now then? The, we wanted to get input on, from the community on the format and content of the Dev Summit 
of this year. Um, this is Dev Summit. Do you remember was like is the last day of the OpenX conference. So while while we're in the early stages of planning that, you know, if you guys have thoughts, it would be great to do that. Oh yeah, put if you can put it in the uh, chat chat in the chat if you have a vote on anything about the snow. Um, authentication is something that actually came up. Uh, Peter uh, at MIT he requested that, so I was going to spend some time on. Uh, giving you guys just an update on where we are at and what our vision is and front-end development efforts uh, We're investing heavily on that now. That's still just starting up, but we have definitely done a bunch of things on, on that as well, so um, Okay, so um, So what I'm hearing is front-end development efforts is what people would like to know about uh, from Felipe as well as Regis, um, and uh, and John is saying that March is coming soon, so Dev Summit. Okay, so what we'll do is we I will not spend time on the architecture, uh, uh, on the sorry, on the authentication aspect. And what we could do is if we do want to, I could let, let's we can have a separate hangout just for that aspect. Um, and but for this one, since we have a larger group, we'll focus on the other two, and then. Peter, if we want, we could actually just do a deeper dive with just your team and invite others to it as well. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, yes, the conference sure. is in March this year. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope that was a joke. Um, yes, the conference is at the end of March in San Diego, California. Um, and so to give to Dev Summit, this is how we did it last year. So uh, if you guys can see my screen, um, well, Wow, somebody. Um, I hope everyone's okay. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we 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 broke it up into like morning breakout sessions and then afternoon breakout sessions, and which breakout sessions we actually held were based on votes that we got beforehand from people, um, and also any instantaneous breakouts that people really wanted to. Uh, you know, organize while they were there. Uh, and so what we did was last year, we had these different topics that uh, we proposed from edX as well as others could add to. Um, and then we had basically like sort of a sign up sheet of people who wanted, who were interested in it. And if there were any particular pre-readings that we want to share out, that was also captured in this. Um, so this 2019 is a new year. We could take learnings from the past, we can, um, move forward and adopt adapt this to in different ways that you know we find are is more useful. Uh, if there are things that worked last year, we can continue. So, any any other? Um, okay, yeah. So auth, we'll we'll do that uh, as a separate thing then. Uh, so we'll we'll do authentication. Not we won't wait until uh, February's. Hangout. I think I I'll just do one in the middle. So maybe like in two weeks or something. Uh, and um, just because it seems like people are interested in that. So, um, but getting back to Dev Summit. Um, any other any thoughts on that, Jan or Ned? Did you guys have any? Well, I'm curious. I'm curious to hear from people online if you were at the Dev Summit last year one thing you liked about it and one thing you thought could be improved. And that would be a good way to feed into the planning for this year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if nobody else, the thing I liked about it was that I was able to talk with a group of people on lightweight analytics. And I found that incredibly useful. A uh, thing I didn't like about it is I didn't feel I was very well prepared to um, manage um, the, the, the breakout session. Um, I hadn't had enough time to, to do my homework and I was unclear on what our process was as we were kind of going through the summit process. I think that's, those are absolutely valid because it was unclear to us as well because it was kind of the first time we were putting it together. But to your point about feeling unprepared, that's actually something we, we were talking about um, a week or so ago because we were trying to figure out how much preparation should we do beforehand? You know, 
and last year we kind of, you know, we had a set of prospective topics and we kind of voted on them. And then we kind of, while we were there, did a bit of an unconferency format. And I love unconference formats, but to your point, like, I think there's a lot of room here to do some, uh, some work, you know, before the event. And so the question is like, what's the right mix? Like, do we need to have like a track of talks where we kind of delineate each into a session? Um, and we have like designated, you know, discussion leaders, uh, like say a month beforehand, that way you, know, you have time to prepare, talk to people that are gonna be involved, that sort of thing. Would that, would that make sense? John, what would what could we have done to have helped you be more prepared? I'm not sure uh, because part of it is I'm looking at like the tension of on the one hand, you know, the the the, the well well preparedness and having everything prepared and go run smoothly maybe. Yeah. Um, and the other, the ad hoc extemporaneous, everyone kind of get together and wow, we've learned like new stuff and there's like this, you know, new thoughts, new energy that comes in that wouldn't have happened if we had uh, pre-mixed uh, the recipe ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the fence on this. Right, and then in terms of, uh, we have other opportunities for, you know, um, allowing people to give talks and doing trainings and workshops and a lot of these other things where preparedness is a prerequisite. Um, one of the, one of the, in my mind, at least from an architectural perspective too, like the reason I love a, an unhangout type of format and less preparedness in some ways is that you get a chance to really be open-minded because you aren't so focused on a specific solution. Um, it's actually an opportunity to get other people's ideas and inputs. So last year, for instance, you know, we talked about, um, you know, things around APIs and extensions. Um, we, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember which other ones. There were, I mean, that one in particular for me, I, I, it was a great learning experience for me because I got a chance to hear out a lot of what other people had to say, uh, a lot of which we are then planning to make use of uh, going forward this year. So um, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's why it's a separate day um, and it's, People, people still want to do a hackathon type thing that I think the one group for mobile did do a hackathon yeah. of, as well. Yeah. But it, it allows for opportunities to just, while we're all there physically, um, you know, getting together and just exchanging thoughts and ideas. Uh, we have birds of a feather as another way of doing that, but birds of a feather are short, shorter period of time and um, in between things. Whereas Dev Summit, you could have more of a deeper dive and a deeper conversation. Yeah. So. Quick point about the mobile, the mobile mm -hmm. hackathon. A lot of that stuff is going to be moved to the mobile summit, which is on the Tuesday, so which will leave more time for you to participate in the dev summit. In the dev summit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, any other thoughts on dev summit? I just have a question around uh, the primary purpose. Is it to actually? squash bugs and hack together and write code or is it more of a learning experience where people are coming together to learn about new things or is it more of a forum for discussion or is it all the above i guess what's what's the primary purpose for i guess for edX like what what would be like an ideal outcome for edX and then what does the community think would be most valuable yeah you know, maybe those maybe those are the same thing but yeah. Um, the, the ideal outcome is that we end up with a collaboratively developed platform that's the best in the world. Like, so the point of this is to really think about what we want to do with OpenEdX for the next mm -hmm. quarter, two quarters, year. It's to really enlist other people to work with us collaboratively to, to formulate what the plan is going forward. Um, we all know that there are obvious, uh, you know, issues with that that we've gone through many, many times, but it's an attempt to move us to a more collaborative community, a more of a, people have described OpenX as like a read-only community, and we'd like to make it more of a read-write community, so. Okay, so if, 
if that's the goal to make it more collaborative, then I absolutely think there needs to be more prep work in advance so that people aren't just showing up sure. and they kind of haphazardly wandering around trying to figure out where they're supposed to be or what they're supposed to be doing. I think it, 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 there should be like a leader for each uh, discussion topic yeah. and information should be shared out in advance so that people have time to read it, digest it, think about it. And I think that will lead to the most fruitful conversations rather than, it felt like, like to your question, Ned, what did I feel like was not great about it? Uh, I felt like there was a general unpreparedness among everyone. Like we weren't quite sure what we were supposed to do in advance. And then so sort of the follow-up afterwards, it felt like we had all these great conversations and then after everyone kind of went back to doing what they're doing. So maybe some documented process for having a scribe in every session that's note taking and then having someone who's responsible for identifying next next steps and actions so that we can actually keep the momentum moving forward and it just, doesn't just die when everyone goes home. I think it's a great idea. So why don't we have sort of like the you know working group so that we can actually you know collaboratively plot this out and actually have mm -hmm. something that uh, you know, works for everyone or for, for more people. Yeah. That sounds great. And um, just so you know, like for last year, we did have uh, designated uh, leaders for each breakout session that we didn't know about beforehand. Um, some of those leaders were from the community, some were from edX. Um, so there was that prep work that was there. Um, and also the evolution of this, right, is that like in 2017, it was really a hackathon day, very, very free form. And now we are now transitioning towards something that's a little bit more structured. But, but allowing for free form if a group chooses to do that because right. it's an extra day that they're there. So, but for the one, the, the, the part of the, the groups that do want to be more structured, I agree that um, um, some prep work would be good. So do we then still though like the format of using a wiki where people propose what the topics are and then vote based on that and then whichever ones we, feel, you know, we, we see have most traction, um, that's where self-declared or, you know, whoever wants to lead that effort can form a subgroup before the conference to prep for it. Is, is that a good way of thinking about it? I, uh, I like the self-organizing wiki, um, but I want to emphasize what you were just saying, Amisha, about um, needing to have a leader um, and in fact, I would, I think one of the problems that we had was uh, the leader and the scribe role were kind of the same, um, which doesn't work well. That's true. Um, so I, I would actually suggest that we break those out. And, and having a good uh, scribe role also helps the fact that you've got simultaneous sessions and people have to decide, you know, where they're going to put their time. Um, it makes it easier to decide if you feel like there's going to be a record of the other meeting. That sounds great. Um, yeah, go ahead. One other thing I just wanted to mention is um, it would help to be clear about the distinction between the Dev Summit and the Birds of a Feather, because I felt like there was some uh, overlap and redundancy between those two. And one of the key differences that I think we only realized too late is that some people only come for the regular conference and don't come to the summit. Um, so thinking about um, being clear about what's going to happen at the summit um, would help people decide whether they're going to attend or not. Right. Um, and if you want input in something from people who aren't, don't consider themselves developers, then you really have to be doing that during the rest of the conference. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely right. Okay, this is great input. Yeah, so for sure. Thank you all very much, and um, keep the keep, also. also yeah, by right. the way, there's a ninety-nine dollar fee, but anyone who contributes, and that includes everyone on this call, gets in for free. So, <laughs> I'm I'm sending out invite codes, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, so that everyone who's here uh, and everyone who's ever contributed to the OpenX community will get invite codes. So, we we wanted to make it more of a an official part of the program. Um, and that's, that's really what the drive is for, uh, uh, for this year. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. And, uh, if you have further thoughts afterwards and whatnot, then, uh, keep the, keep the feedback and communication flowing, um, reach 
uh, we ch we chose in Slack again or yeah. or anyone directly on Slack. Okay, cool. So the next item that we wanted to cover today was um, just an update on some of the front end work that we're doing. Um, now I'm thinking that maybe the best way of talking about that is to remind everyone like what what where it is that we're trying to head here um okay sorry uh i was planning to spend more time on authentication so that's why i'm just like shifting gears here sorry. but like no that's fine um so front end um decoupled front end architecture right so this is this is where we want to head and if you guys remember Ari's talk from last year uh, she covered this um, uh, in, in her talk but essentially what we're trying to show here is stage four is where we want to go right where our front end is implemented in react and it is independently deployed meaning in order to make any changes to a front end and roll it out to your production um, servers and whatnot, you do not need to necessarily change or de redeploy any backend servers. So these would be these would be statically hosted on Amazon S3, right? So there's different JavaScript files and um, static assets that are all in Amazon S3 um, and we're, we've developed them in React and so forth. Uh, and they are then independently deployed to the user's browsers. Um, and any then communications to the back end, right, is all happening through API. We would not be making use of Django server side rendering of pages. Pages would instead be, once again, written in React, statically hosted, Amazon S3 and whatnot. Um, it would, we would not see front end code in Django. So any questions on that, is that, clear from where basically where we want to target with what we call split front ends or um yeah yeah uh, yeah john um so i just was reading the comp <clears throat> the the note in the bottom um basically having the templates uh be uh mako or, or django templates and i urge that whenever um, if <clears throat> unless something has like a really compelling uh feature in it that we stick with what's standard um, in a package or framework to help um, um, the familiarity with people in the community. I know that Mako is like a lot more powerful than Django templates, but my thoughts are just thinking, if everything's in React anyway, then the template is really just a vehicle to push the static asset bundle out. Right, and that's phase one. So by the time we get to phase four, there's no templates whatsoever. We don't have to decide what length to write the templates in. Right. So I was just like looking at the Mako because Mako <clears throat> more powerful, but it's you know it's it, there's you have to get familiar with how Mako template works. Whereas if you're a Django developer, then you've already been working with the Django templates. Just right. as a for example. Right. right. So, um, but yeah, to next point, like, um, yeah, I guess I'm going through of like where we want to head. Um, and in that vision, uh, you know, we would be basically writing our code in um, JavaScript, uh, you know, JSX files and whatnot in React. Uh, these are then um, bundled together using Webpack and so forth um, and deployed. Uh, these JavaScript libraries, right, are also, um, uh, pushed up to npm so you, anyone could then npm install these javascript libraries uh, and all a lot of this we have already started doing in-house uh, and we will you know we have specific applications and i can go through some of that as well like which ones are already using that so for instance here um the uh, okay actually let me, so we have uh, a wiki page that I created with our various front end repos. The ones up here are the ones that are currently what we call micro front ends, right? Meaning um, they are single page apps, they're separate, they're independently deployed. 
and um, they make, make use of components and other things in other front end libraries. Um, and they may have been started with, you know, have been created with any of our cookie cutters here. Um, things that we are. Going to Did someone disagree with that? Or? I don't think that was important. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, th what things that we are deprecating are UI pattern libraries and themes and toolkits and so forth. One other view that might be interesting, and you know, we have I haven't yet published this yet because it's still under development. Um, but I found it useful, and that's why I'm gonna just let you guys know that this is under works. I found it useful when uh, bringing uh, people up to speed on my team. But uh, the thing, it's a technology radar is something that ThoughtWorks uses, and um, it is at a glance showing uh, you know, where we are with what things we've adopting, what things we're still assessing, what things we've deprecated. So for instance, for our front end framework, right? Um, sorry, hold on, I'm trying to zoom in here. Uh, you know, we, we are adopting React, Jest, and Enzyme for testing, Paragon as our reusable component library upon which design system will be implemented and, and so forth, Bootstrap, um, uh, and, uh, you know, is our way of doing quick, you know, initial styling and a lot of our components are then based on Bootstrap um, and Paragon is basically adding accessibility and reactifying Bootstrap. Um, Redux is our data management layer and, and so on and so forth. So we mentioned these um, SAS is for our styling. Uh, Axios, uh, Babel, you guys may know, right? It's for being able to convert um, you know, between languages. Uh, and for Axios, we're using that for making asynchronous calls when needed. There, there is some, we, we are, these, all of these other things are now therefore going to, we would like to deprecate them and move away from them. So, uh, you know, doing bok choy tests and lettuce tests and require JS, Django templates, Mako templates, UI pattern library. We have a whole slew of things from our past and our legacy, uh, which we wanna basically now move away from. Uh, so anyway, that, that, this particular link is there if you guys want to, uh, like I said, this is still under works. Um, this, what I just went through was our front end technologies. Uh, we have other things in here, like, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but like, you know, just in terms of techniques, like what are things that we are adopting um, and what things we're trialing. And, you know, this has to do with architectural techniques and stuff like that. Um, yes, we want to move away from our monolith and our ball of mud. Um, doing Yagni pluses and minuses. Anyway, I, I definitely digress here. There's a lot of stuff here I love to always talk about. So, um, but anyway, there is one about front end technology. So you guys can take a look at that. And that this came from the, it's in work in progress PR right now in the open edX repo that has a link to it. So that's still under works. Now going back to front end and where, where we are, um, the, the one of the so, so what we went when we went through right now is just like where we want to head with with stage four. Oh, I think there was a question from Omar is are we at what happened here? Um, are we at where are we in this milestone, right? And sorry, someone was saying, something? yeah, that's me. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So yeah, um, I my best estimate is that we are somewhere closer to nine, uh, sorry, to milestone two, but um, like previous question, which is the same. Um, at which point are we close, like to the end of it or to the start? Yeah. Or are we like not even? Close? Right. So um, as things are with our platform, we have a huge platform, and as we're moving things forward, I will say that we are in all stages. <laughs> it depends on the feature, right? Um, so we have, uh, you know, core features right now that are still in stage one, right? So for instance, like our 
courseware pages, right? Where our courseware content is, like Kappa problems and all that stuff. Like that's all stage one right now. It's all Django server side. And uh, X blocks, for instance, are also essentially in stage one. Um, there, stage two, there have been a few things that have been come in, that have come in through the open edX community and other places people have started inserting for instance things in the instructor dashboard or on a learner dashboard and things like that where they know that we're heading towards react and therefore they started writing their new front end code in react but unfortunately because the page that it con that contains it is still using django server side they are now you know inserting their react front end in a django server side page and that's where stage two is so there are some features that came in recently that are like that um, but stage three for instance we have some places right now uh, the studio front end I think is the main one that's in stage three where that whole entire th there is one page which is a files and uploads page which was recently implemented by a team here at edX and that was completely written in react unfortunately uh, well, fortunately, you know, depends how you look at it, but um, the way that that page is deployed currently is via Studio's deployment. So even that entire, even though the entire files and uploads page is implemented in React, you still need to redeploy the entire edX platform, the entire Studio to, um, you know, for any, if you want to make any updates to it. Uh, and the reason that that one is in stage three was because we hadn't yet started implementing a mechanism for people to independently deploy front ends. We have now, and therefore now all new um, apps that we create are now in stage four. So the 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 list of front end repos that I mentioned that I showed earlier, those are all um, the oh, whoops. the ones on top. Those are all in stage four. Um, and you guys can, oh, sorry, no, Studio Frontend isn't. So Studio Frontend is in stage three, but the others, publisher, journals, Prospectus is our enterprise admin dashboard. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, edX portal is our uh, enterprise admin dashboard. Um, Gradebook is a new feature on the instructor dashboard. So those are all in stage four. Um, I think Prospectus is currently private source, but that's what we use for our marketing site. So, um, but one thing we're okay. still working out is how to internationalize and uh, simplify the deployment of these applications. So if you're looking at doing front end, new front end work or want to keep up to date with where we are going, you could take a look at, for instance, the Gradebook app, um, which is, I think, the latest uh, uh, micro front end that's been written here and see how it works. Yeah. Um. Right, and, yeah. and, and in the, uh, the training session, the, that first day of the conference, uh, there was a group of people here at edX that are gonna come and do a training session on creating micro front ends, which include, will include using one of our cookie cutters to create that initial front end application and then deploying it um, and, and making changes to it and so forth. So there will be a training workshop on that. Sorry, were there any questions there? Yeah, I was going to ask, um, you mentioned internationalization yes. uh, as a way to translate the streams, but I've noticed, I might be all updated here since I'm looking at the Haufen code, but back then there was still uh, some issues trying to remove strings from the platform that were normally settings that you can change, like the edX name. So if I turn on the feature, at least for how for master, if I turn on the feature to delete micro in my account, I will come up with a message saying that this will remove my account from edX.org and the edX app and so so so. so. Um, has that been uh, looked into already? Well, I didn't know about those issues. Um, have you written Jira issues about them, or like what? what I haven't because we just finished the migration to Houghton last week, so I'm starting to look into that now. I, I guarantee you that if we didn't hear about it from the outside, one of our <laughs> would not have noticed that problem. So you can be very, very vocal about it. Okay. okay. 
Yep, actually, we re do we, yeah, just to echo what Ned said, we definitely do rely on the community to help us with the internationalization effort. We have, I think, only three languages or something on our, on our website, but collectively we have like 45 or 50 you guys you know it's it's awesome what right. the community has done there right. in this case so, what felipe is yeah. saying isn't actually a translation issue it's the fact that we have, we've, we've forgotten that other sites are not called edx yes <laughs> the word edx in a string that's true yes. that's true yes right. um, especially since because if i leave that edx there you would probably call me and say like you're not edx this is a trademark <laughs> so i try to remove those and felipe, then the good news is we're also not doing that no, no. I, I got an, an, an email once about that, but that was long ago. And we will try to keep the edX name out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a different topic for another day, but we'd love to figure out how to also connect all of our open edX instances and so we can flourish together. Um, and that's, but anyway, Burkai and others have other um, a vision for that. But um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a different topic. So in that, if, if in that vision, if that vision does pan out, Philippe at that time, we'd love to actually figure out how we can publicize edX through other open edX instances. Um, but anyway, stay tuned on that. Uh, I only have a few more minutes, so I just want to go through a few things here. Um, so the, um, this is a, our, the roadmap for the architecture team, which um, I'm leading here at edX. Um, so we are here at January 2019. What we've done to date is really focused a lot around authentication to enable us to be able to do authentication for our micro front ends. Um, the reason we call it micro front end is because we don't want to create a monolith front end. We don't want all of our code in one specific, you know, like in one front end repo. We've learned our lessons from our monolith in the back end and we want to just be conscious of where we draw the line, lines and the boundaries on our front ends. Um, so, but anyway, so we've done a lot of effort around authentication. Uh, we started working on a header and footer that we can share across these apps. Now, th th those are all runways, um, basically leading to now this 2019, this effort to what some people may call replatforming. Um, whatever but essentially what it is is we're going we're focusing on rewriting some of the pages the core pages in our platform we're starting with the learner profile now these are yes django server side rendered and they're going to be having there's going to be a lot of tech debt in them they will not have rest apis and so forth so um what that's what we're, our, my team here is going to be tackling uh we're going to start um rewriting these pages and we're hoping that a lot of these things that we do along the way is gonna then help speed up rewriting future pages, right? So micro front end is something that came up and uh, we need to figure, sorry, internationalization is something that came up and we need to figure out how to handle that. Analytics was another one. Um, this whole thing, which is called design system, right? We're trying to figure out how do we have, Paragon is a step forward to, to this, but it's not a sustainable, maintainable model right now. But basically design system is a term that um, the industry uses for talking about having reusable, you know, shared components that you can, whether it's buttons or um, search or, you know, and it could even be at like a page template level, all of those things that, you know, you implement it and design it once and then you can reuse it in all of your front end applications. It's really helped meant to address a lot of things. For instance, it helps with consistency of your user experience. It will help with, um, of course, uh, developing faster. Um, and the thing at, at edX, and one thing that works, uh, is such a great asset for us is that we do have a high focus on accessibility. And so we will make sure that our design system really addresses the accessibility needs that we have for our users. So accessibility, uh, React, and um, reusability, um, and you know, all of those things would be addressed with these reusable components. Uh, and we're hoping that once we get that down, then we will be able to be quicker at rewriting um, a lot of these pages. So that's our roadmap there. Uh, another visualization of this, of what we've done, right, is targeting the deployment, the authentication header footer. Right now we're at this place of trying to figure out a design system and theming is going to be part of that. 
So however, it's something that we're going to look at. I do hope to have a better answer about theming before our conference. So that's you know, our, our target there. But um, one of the things that we'll be evaluating when we're evaluating a design system is to make sure that it can handle the theming needs that we have. And along, um, these are all processes, nothing here really to front end, but like the fact that API practices is something that we're going to start also looking into given that um, now that we will not be doing Django server side rendering our front ends, right, we'll need uh, REST APIs in place. And so when we do that, we'll need to make sure that we have um, API practices. Uh, last thing, uh, is it worthwhile to show? Right, I think because someone had a question about this. Um, they, they had a question about mobile apps and React. Um, there is this page, so if you guys want to take a look at it before our hangout also on authentication. Um, but essentially, nah, never mind, there's a lot of information here. Um, so yeah, I will get to it. Um, I think it's more important. We have two minutes left. Let me see, are there any open questions here, Ned? Uh, that no. People had... Okay. They're talking about string stuff. Oh, they're talking um, about string stuff. Okay. Yeah, sorry that Jeremy isn't here. I think it might be a miscommunication. I said I'd start out the conversation, and maybe he thought I was going to handle the whole conversation. <laughs> uh, but in any case, we we do want to figure out how best to tackle the Python 3 problem. And we're also interested to hear your particular slants on it. It's, it's uh, hard for us to remember your worlds, you know, keep it maintaining Ginkgo full time, for instance. So let, it, let us know how we can uh, make this all work together. Any other open questions, discussion? Yeah, I went, I went through the front end one very quickly, um, and we'll talk about it again at the Open NX conference. But if you guys have any questions and whatnot, I think you'll see some conversations go through in the architecture channel about, about this work that we're, we're embarking on. So. Uh, sorry. So I have one question regarding the APIs and the front end. Yeah. Uh, so, um, are, did you start already to try to just map out all of the APIs and endpoints, like endpoints that are going to need to be implemented, and or are you still writing the very like low level kind of uh, authentication and stuff? discussions yeah so um the, the low level authentication stuff like we've done what we need to date for micro front ends um there's a lot more still to do in terms of removing old stuff and updating old stuff to use the new and things like that but that we're not embarking on right now so we paused mm -hmm. that effort on authentication um so but uh sorry so you were asking about oh yeah apis apis yeah. the thing is uh there is this document call um, th there's a lot when it comes to APIs and right now we're only going to be focusing on the APIs that we need for the front-end applications that we are rewriting so um, this diagram here mm -hmm. uh, oh no where is it the um, Can you get yeah we're gonna get to this room in a few minutes. Yeah, are. actually now. But I was gonna say that basically we're tackling this these set of APIs, right? So the ones where micro front ends can communicate with the microservices. And so this these set of APIs are basically developer facing APIs. We're not yet tackling the APIs on the bottom, which is really more about like what is the public set of APIs for edX, right? As a platform. Mm -hmm. Um, and that one, there are, there are some teams tackling, for instance, uh, working with and integrating with different proctoring services and stuff like that. So as we're making integrations with different uh, vendors and stuff, that's how we're tackling that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't actually, I wasn't really interested, like asking about those bottom ones. I was just asking about the top ones. Yeah, so yeah, the, the top ones, yes. The ones that communicate with the front end. For example, the, the, the API that actually returns a certain part of a course. You know, for right. A course stuff like that and how their structures are going to look like. Yes, yes, that's exactly. Something that would be very, yeah, that could have a lot of conversations in the front end community because I'm guessing a lot of different people would like to see it written differently, I guess. 
Okay. Yeah. So let's let's um, talk about this next time. Uh, we can put it on the agenda as well. Um, uh, and I'll I'll tell you my thoughts uh, more about how to do those because I think there are different flavors of APIs there too. But thank you all so much. Um, we're at that time, and I love that this was a uh, very much of a um, flowing conversation with the community also being. Um, it was a read write. Uh, yes, yeah. it was a read write. <laughs> so okay, thank you all thank so you. much. Take Bye. care. Thank bye you. bye.